God bless you guys for being here today. Thank you for joining another service with Star Bethlehem CME Church. Um, if you're joining us by Zoom, good morning. God bless you. If you're joining us by phone, good morning to you guys. God bless you. Uh, if you are joining us uh, later on today by YouTube or on another day by Facebook, God bless you guys. I hope God is, is keeping you uh, the way God is certainly keeping us. Uh, God bless you today. We have a uh, hopefully a great message for you today, uh, something that will challenge you, something that will encourage you to grow. And we pray that God is continuing uh, to help you through um, 
this particular time. God bless you. God bless you. We're going, we're going to look at, please uh, uh, pray with me for a moment uh, as we begin our service. Our text, of course, will come from Matthew 16, 13 to, through 20, so you can get your Bibles or your phones ready, um, or you can, of course, view the screen here with me um, if you're listening, or you can listen to me if you're listening. Um, let's pray. Oh, God, our Father, we're so grateful and thankful for this time and moment, God, as we look back over our last week, God, we know that there have been times that uh, that certainly you could have taken us. There are times, oh God, that we didn't deserve some of the blessings that you've given us. But God, every day that we woke up over the last week, God, we experienced brand new mercies. Thank you, God. Thank you for continuing to bless us and keep us uh, in spite of all the things that we may have missed, that the opportunities that we may have passed over, the, the times we could have blessed somebody, God. You are still blessing us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, God, we pray now for all those who've assembled here that you will continue to bless them, continue to give them soundness of mind, continue to give them uh, not the spirit of fear, oh God, but that you would give them a spirit of power. Uh, God, that you continue to bless those who couldn't be with us, uh, those who are parts of our family, our church family, and those extended uh, from our church family, our friends of the church, um, that you bless them and bless them real good. But God, we pray a special prayer for those who are the last, the lost, and the least, um, those who, do, who, who maybe don't know that you still love them, Maybe they are disgruntled with the church. Maybe, God, they are disgruntled with the pastor. Maybe, God, they're disgruntled with just with life in general. And, God, we just ask that you keep them, and that you keep them in perfect peace, God, and that somehow, some way, that somebody who's connected to the body of Christ uh, will have compassion in their heart, will have love in their soul, God, that will have working in their hands and their feet, and they will go out and love on that person and bring them back into the fold. And we will celebrate we celebrate as we never done before. God, we thank you now for this time and opportunity. We pray for the word that is to come forth and that you continue to bless everybody who hears it and those who spread it. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Our text, Matthew 16, 13 through 20, uh, reads thusly, Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. I will tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Amen. Praise God and bless God for his word. Amen. Amen. Today's subject would be, uh, I can't find my keys. I can't find my keys. I can't find my keys. Uh, it is it is a perplexing thing when you're about to be on the way somewhere, right? In that in that usually when it is when you're on the way somewhere, you're trying to get somewhere, you're trying to get to work. Um, praise God, you're trying to, to 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 make an appointment. You're trying to get to church, right? And you can't find your keys. You can't find your keys, and you gotta gotta look for the second set of keys. And some of you may remember one of those old fad gifts, the clapper that used to help you find your keys, or some of you even have uh, apps on your phone now that help you find your keys. But, but there was a time, and maybe perhaps there still is a time, where it, is, where it becomes extremely frustrating when you're trying to go somewhere, but your keys are missing. And uh, most of the time, it's, it's where you put them last uh, that you've forgotten, that you put them down when you were distracted, that you put them down thinking that you were putting them in a good place, and all of a sudden now, you can't find your keys. Well, there's one thing that's more, um, I, I guess, worse, so to speak, than losing your keys. The one thing I think that's worse than losing your keys is losing somebody else's keys, right? Losing somebody else's keys. And, and as we look at this text today, we understand that, that although Jesus is talking to Peter, that we find that the keys to the kingdom, right? All this loosening and binding on earth and in heaven, all this stuff starts with the keys to the kingdom. Peter has been given the keys, but not just Peter, right? On this rock, I build my church. The church has been given the keys. The disciples were given the keys. This new church was given the keys. 
And now, though it seems like in 2020, you know, we can argue um, that point, but it seems that sometimes that we're in situations where, oh my God, I cannot find my keys. Something has happened in our life. Something has happened in our world. Something has happened in our nation. Something has happened in my household. Something has happened in my church and I, had, and I don't have the keys to the kingdom. I don't know how to loose and bind because I don't have this access to God. There's so many distractions. There's so much going on. I can't find somebody else's keys. And the pressure becomes overwhelming. The pressure becomes more than we can bear. So I want to I look at this text um, in this context of, of thinking about how we function, how the church functions in the world, how all of us function in our communities and in the world at large, um, and this idea of, of Jesus giving this gift uh, to the church to be able to have some very special and specific power. So let's, let's look at a couple of things real quick. The first thing that I want to share with you as we look, you, you all know this text, people have read this, this text many times before, but I hope that there are some new things that you can glean from this text. The first thing, how you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. How you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. So in, in verse 13, um, it, uh, Jesus asked the question, who do people say the son of man is? And the disciples are replying, they're answering the question about who do people say the son of man, who do people say Jesus is? They say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, uh, some say Jeremiah. These are all both prophets uh, from Old Testament times or one of the prophets, right? And so, and, and so Jesus then asked the follow-up question, well, who do you say I am? And Peter uh, steps up and answers the question. But, but, but this, is, this is the point that I want us to, to understand about, there's a couple of things about this particular question and about this particular text that I want us to, to glean for us in this time, right? How you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. Now, now here's the thing. When you ask the question, who do people say I am? and people have different answers for that question. Their answer is, is, is determined by the experience that they've had or uh, the relationship or lack thereof that they have had with Jesus. So our relationship or our tradition or our experience informs how we feel or what we think Jesus is capable of. Let, let, follow, me, follow me if you will. So some people say you're John the Baptist. So some people think, some people think in the characteristics of John the Baptist, one, that you are a regular man. Two, that you are still the forerunner for somebody. You aren't the Messiah. You are still somebody who's coming before this Messiah. And then some people say, well, you're one of the prophets. Well, they just think that you're a man that's sent by God and that you're giving us a message and, and the Old Testament has ended, but this is like the new, new Old Testament, right? And so you're just somebody sent from God who's, who's telling us that we need to repent or God's going to get mad at us and then God's going to get mad at us, then God's going to forgive us, and then we're going to mess up again, and the cycle continues. So some people have the mentality that Jesus is simply just another prophet. The danger with that is that how you determine, how you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. If you only think Jesus is the forerunner coming before somebody, how can your sins be saved by the, his death on the cross and resurrection if you don't fully understand what Jesus is and who Jesus, what Jesus has done? If you think that Jesus is just a prophet, would you still um, hang your salvation on Jesus, knowing that he is just a prophet and not the actual son of the living God and the Messiah? How you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. One, one thing that I want to, another thing that I want to point out too in this particular text, it is interesting that when asked this question, people don't agree. People don't generally agree on who Jesus is. In this text, they didn't agree. In Jesus' time, in this text, they didn't agree. But also in today's time, people still don't agree on who Jesus is. Some denominations still think that Jesus was a good man, that he was uh, a good man, but he wasn't the son of God, or that, or that some people think that Jesus didn't even exist at all, and I only believe in God. I don't really believe in Jesus. Some people think that Jesus um, was, had different other characteristics, that he was uh, more human than he was God. And so that you've got all these different theories and all these different uh, suggestions about who Jesus 
is even today people don't agree on who Jesus is but the question that we have to ask ourselves that's I think really important is that is there he's asking the disciples this question disciples are with him the disciples are the ones ministering to people disciples are oftentimes talking to people having conversations with people that's the way that they know who people think Jesus is the question we have to ask ourselves is is there a disconnect between those ministering and those who are receiving ministry. Because if you know who Jesus is and the disciples knew who Jesus was and the people who you're ministering to don't know who Jesus is, where is the disconnect? Is it in our ministry? Is it in how we carry ourselves? Is it in the things that we say? Is it in the things that we do? Is it, is it how we package it up? Is it in the way we live our lives? We have to ask ourselves some serious questions. If I know who Jesus is and my neighbor does not, if I know who Jesus is and somebody in my household does not, what responsibility do I have for the misinterpretation that they have about Jesus? That's something that you got to discover. That's something you got to deal with. That's something that you got to pray about. But most certainly you need to be asking yourself that question. One more thing before we, before we move to the, to the next point. How you recognize Jesus will determine what you expect of Jesus. They're, 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 oftentimes we think of Jesus not as Lord and Savior, right? But we think of Jesus as ATM, right? Or we think of Jesus as superhero. Or we think of Jesus as custodian. So let, let's, let's, let's look at that real quick. So, so Jesus is, you know, there, there are many ministries. Even, even right now in this hour, there, there are ministries that are going on. There are churches and there are, there are pastors who are preaching messages right now who present the image that you, if you sow a seed, you'll reap a hundredfold, right? You're going to get that. And this image that says, if you give a little bit, God's going to give you back a lot of money. Or if you, act, if you do this, then God's going to do this for you. I see this as Jesus as an ATM. You know, what happens is I go to the ATM, I put my card in, I put my code in, and the bank gives me the money that I have in there. We think Jesus is like that. Like, whatever I need, I'm just going to pray about it. Oh, I need to pay this bill. I'm just going to pray about it. Oh, I need, need this. I need a new car. I'm just going to pray about it. Oftentimes, we don't consider the will of God. We just consider what we want and simply put in our order. We simply put our card into the, the Jesus ATM, punch in our, our code, and we expect money to just come out. We expect blessings just to come out just because we ask for it. That, that is flawed because our idea of Jesus as ATM is flawed. It's, it depends on, on you wanting something from Jesus, not you wanting Jesus. Jesus as superhero. How many times in our lives have we prayed that prayer? Jesus, oh, come see about me. Jesus, come help me. Jesus, come, like Jesus is this distant, like he's waiting uh, in, his, in his hideout for the bat symbol to go up in the air. And when the bat symbol goes up, then I snap into action and I come and save the day. I get it. I get it. I get it. I know that Jesus in some ways uh, responds to our needs, responds to our situations. But oftentimes, again, are we praying to be in the will of Jesus? Maybe some of those things we need to go through. Maybe those, some of those things you don't need to be delivered from. Somebody next to you needs to help deliver you from it. We need to work together to be delivered from it. Or maybe sometimes I got to pull up my bootstraps and make some things happen so that, I, so that the God in me can show out to somebody else. It's one of those things we have to think about. But this idea of Jesus as just being this superhero in his hideout just waiting for you to call him and then he just shows up and saves the day that is flawed because how you recognize jesus will determine what you expect of jesus and then lastly this idea of jesus as custodian right as custodian we believe many of us that we we talked to the the very first summer that we had this particular uh conference here was clean up what i messed up right clean up what i messed up clean up behind yourself Right. We think that Jesus is our custodian. We think that Jesus just comes in. We just do what we want to do, live how we want to live, mess up how we want to mess up, pray a little prayer at the altar. And then come in, Jesus swoops in and cleans up all of our mess just so we can go back and, and mess up again. But we don't have to look at our mess. We don't have to sit in our mess. We don't have to clean up our own mess because Jesus is our, my custodian and he's going to clean it up. The, the, the issue with all of these types of ways of recognizing Jesus. Jesus as somebody who just provides, right? Jesus as ATM, Jesus as custodian, Jesus as a superhero. 
The, the problem with that is that it makes Jesus a transactional relationship. There's something that I need. That's something that you have. Let's go ahead and trade out my need for what you have and make some things happen. And it doesn't portray Jesus as somebody that we have a relationship with. What I would say is that Jesus needs to be our mentor. Jesus needs to be our guide. Jesus needs to be our best example. Jesus needs to be uh, our savior. Jesus need, needs to be our Lord, which directs our life. And none of those things are an ATM or a superhero or a custodian. But how you recognize Jesus, whether you're in this question that, the, that, that is being asked to the disciples, it's important to understand that if you don't have a reconciled in your mind how you see Jesus, then you will never be able to reconcile in your heart or in your mind what you expect of Jesus. Do you only expect Jesus to give you a ticket to heaven? Is that the only thing you see Jesus as? It's an important thing, but is that the only relationship that you have, that Jesus died for my sins, and so one day when I die, I'm going to go to heaven? What about now? What about, how, what about the time that Jesus spent and how he tried to, to, to reform the church, how he tried to reform families, how he tried to reform culture? What about our responsibility to the people who are yet living? So we have to ask ourselves a question. How do I recognize Jesus? Second thing, God bless you. The second thing, where you make your declaration, right, is just as important as what you say. Where you make your declaration is just as important as what you say. I want to I I look at something, and, and a lot of times we, we skip over this, and I want you to go back, and you can go back and do your own reading. I don't have time to, to kind of go deep, deep, deep into it, but I, I want to give you some highlights. Um, it is interesting, and I don't believe it's by, by, by happen. Uh, I don't think Jesus just happens to do this. It says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, all right, we know what happens while he's there. But what we have to make sure we understand is where he is. And then we have to try to get an idea, or at least explore the idea of why he's there. Now, Jesus, in this particular moment, reveals to the disciples exactly who he is, although I would argue that he's revealed it before. We've been seeing it. He's been telling them, oh, ye of little faith, like five or six times in our last few weeks that we've been together, right? And he's trying to get them to recognize something. And it looks like, ding, 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 ding. It looks like all of a sudden now they have recognized, oh, you are the son of God. But where are they when this happens? I think it's interesting. They are not at church. They are not in the temple. They are not in the synagogue. They are in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Why is that significant? I'm glad you asked. Caesarea Philippi was a city that was actually on a, a really major hill, a rock, so to speak, right? But the Caesarea part was 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 Caesar Augustus, right? This particular uh, town city um, was named after region, was named after Caesar Augustus, right? The Philippi was the son of Herod. We all remember Herod from our from our earlier Matthew and earlier uh, Gospels, right? Um, so we got this place that is named after and meant to represent the government, right? That's meant to represent the powers that be, that are meant to represent this Greco-Roman culture, right? It's even meant to represent this, this buy-in, so to speak, this assimilation that happens between the, the, the Jewish culture, people like Herod, who are in charge on behalf of the Romans, and now they are, 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 are building monuments and building temples and building things to be recognized as being looked up to them based on their status being above you. So uh, follow me, follow me, follow me. So what, what happens is, is that this place, Caesarea Philippi, is known for its, its, um, its politics, right? It's known for its representation. And then religiously, it's known to be, there's a, um, there's a God um, called Pan, P-A-N. And this God, uh, Pan, is, 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 is half man, half goat, and, and, and so there's all kinds of rituals that are done to this particular God. There are, there are different bestiality type things and different 
um, sacrificial things. And that was also done in this region. So, so follow me, follow me. In this place where Jesus has chosen to declare to the disciples who he is, it is a place that is known for its politics and for its religious issues. It's known for that. Jesus has chosen this place, Caesarea Philippi, as the place where he allowed himself to be known for who he is. That's interesting. That's good. That's something, that's something deep right there. Because God goes basically behind enemy lines, so to speak, to declare my sovereignty. God goes into a situation where that's supposed to be overrun with sin to declare my sovereignty. Jews were not even allowed to go to this particular region because if you went there, you were considered unclean. They didn't see where the church had any authority in this region, but yet Jesus goes there to declare who he is. This Greco-Roman culture, this Greco-Roman place, this, 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 this religious, uh, this, this place where religious issues, right, is the place where Jesus goes and declares who he is. What does that mean? How does that, what does that mean for us today? This is what I think that means, is that, is that even in this world that we live in right now, we know that, the, that the powers that be, we, we know that the Greek and the Romans have, have gone away, and we know uh, other, other people have come and gone, the, the, the Dutch have come and gone, the English have come and gone, the French have come and gone, but there is still this idea, even no matter who holds the mantle, no matter who holds the torch, there's still an idea from a certain group of people that says, I am the oppressor and I'm gonna keep some other people oppressed, whatever that looks like, whether it's based on the region you live in, whether it's based on the color of your skin, whether it's based on, on the God whom you serve, whatever it is, there it still becomes this, this, this tension between the haves and the have nots. And we see this even in this situation. So the equivalent is that Jesus wants us to make sure that we are ministering to people behind enemy lines, not just at the church, not just in our household, not just with people who we know will receive the message, but also with people who are outside of our circles, who also need to know the love of Jesus. So where you make your declaration is just as important as what you say. I don't think it was by chance that Jesus found himself in this place, this foreign place, this Caesarea Philippi, behind enemy lines, so to speak, declaring who I am. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church so that it doesn't have boundaries, so that the people who, are, who, you, think, who you think are off limits are, also have access to me. The last thing, last thing, God bless you. The world is a mess because of what the church has loosed and what the church has bound. The world is a mess because of what the church has loosed and what the church has bound. Let, let's, let's look, this is why I say that. This is why I say that. Verse 20, let's look at it again. 16, Jesus, verse 17, he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by the Father, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the first thing we have to conceive, right? The first thing we have to accept is that the loosing and the binding is done by this church, this church, Peter. I'm building my church upon this situation, upon this event. I'm building my church upon this relationship that I have with you. And I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And as the church, you're going to have the ability to loose some things. You're going to have the ability to also bind some things. You're going to have the ability to allow some things to happen, encourage some things to happen, create some situations, but you're going to also have the ability to bind some things, to keep some things from happening to slow down some things, to, to negate some things, to destroy some things. That is some power that the church has. The issue is, the issue is, is that the church as a institution, the church as a body 
has a responsibility in this mess that we call a world right now because many of the political policies and the cultural policies and the issues that we are facing even today were instigated or encouraged or maybe even originated in the church. When we see shortly after the, the fall of, uh, when we see shortly before the fall of Rome, when the church becomes the, when Christianity, right, becomes the main religion of the Roman Empire, we see a situation that begins the entanglement or the, 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 the tangling up, right, of religion and politics. When the emperor becomes now the leader of the church to manipulate the people, Constantine looked at at Constantine looked at his situation. He looked at the Roman Empire. He was ruling over all these people. And he looked at these little group of Christians over here. And he said, oh, look how they called each other brother and sister. Look how they treat each other. Look how they're trying to continue the statutes of this man, this perfect man and, 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 and who died for their sins named Jesus. Look at this group of, of young Christians. And, and, he, and he started to look at that and study that. He said, if I can, if I can use that model throughout the whole Roman Empire, maybe I can control the boundaries if I can create that feeling. He wasn't at all interested in Christianity. What he was interested in, what he saw as the benefits of Christianity that helped him rule the world. And ever since then, I would dare say even before then, but especially since then, we have seen this entangling of politics and the church throughout what in, end up becoming the Roman Catholic Church that has been documented throughout history, issues where the Pope, the leader of the church, and the kings were, were in cahoots together doing stuff. And you didn't know who was pulling. You didn't know who started the war, the Pope or the king. You didn't know who had somebody killed, the Pope or the king. You didn't know, you didn't know who, was, who had all the outside kids and was sleeping with everybody in the, in the place the Pope or the King. You didn't know, it, 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 was, it was the same thing. The Pope ran the church, the Pope also ran the King. So a lot of the stuff that we deal with has come through administrations through countries based on the direction of the church. Look at some of these things. We don't have time to go into, into all of them, but I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to be thinking, I want you to think. Colonization. Colonization started with the church saying, you know what, I think it would be a good idea if we go over to Africa or we go to some of these other countries and we establish shop and we show them how to be good Christians and we take the message to them and we baptize them in their rivers and in, uh, in their oceans and, and, we, and we, show the good, we show the good Africans how to be good Christians. The flaw with that is that people don't understand and don't accept that this whole issue, everything that happens in this Bible takes place in Northeast Africa. Everything in here takes place. Where do you think Egypt is other than in Africa? Where do you think Israel is other than right next to Africa? <laughs> but all of a sudden now, these church folks out of the West decided we're going to come to Africa and make some good Christians out of, out, of, out of these Africans. Again, this policy of colonization, which ended up becoming slavery, started by somebody in the church saying, I think we need to go down there and save the savages. All the time knowing that they really wanted to get that free labor. They really wanted the diamonds. They really wanted the resources that they found in Africa. And the only way we could get it was to manipulate the people into even giving it to us or selling, to, selling it to us for, for discount, or we take it from them. All those missionaries, some of them may have had some good hearts, but they were being directed by somebody who was in charge that was using the church to loose the wrong thing. Hmm, interesting. Even this world we live in now, where capitalism is our main form of economics, it's interesting that in a capitalistic society, which most of us um, don't really have an argument against because we don't know a whole lot of, to, be, to have an argument against, it's interesting that the capitalist society is based on haves, having 
in order for you to have, that's bound to be some folks who have not. We live in the richest country people still, I mean, in the world, but yet people still don't have sufficient health care. We live in the richest country, but yet you still, you, your education is based on where you live, not based on the fact that everybody should have a quality education. The reason why that is, my friends, is because a lot of those things, right, as, we, as, as people continue to tell us, our nation was founded, our forefathers were just good Christians. Our forefathers uh, believed in God. They believed that the church, but our forefathers also allowed slavery. Our forefathers also made sure that they were taken care of even when they were taken away from people who did not have. And that has continued. It even continues sometimes in the church. There are churches who are positioning themselves even right now with the haves and have nots. They have their position to, to take advantage of people who don't have so that they can make sure that people who do have are taken care of. So I, I, I spent a lot of time talking about these things that have been loosed over centuries, over generations, and they've been loosed by the church. All of these things were sanctioned and ordained through the church. They use text to continue slavery. They use text in the Bible to continue slavery. They use text in the Bible to create some of the Jim Crow laws. They use text in the Bible to justify it being okay for some people to have and some other people to be starving. And even right now, even right now, we have a leader of our country who will use this, this book as a photo op to make sure he gets reelected. And people all over the country who are in the church validate him and prop him up and will vote for him. My friends, there's a lot of work to do. But part of the work that we're having to correct, the first thing we have to understand is that part of that work has come through the church. <laughs> part of those issues have come through the church. We have to reclaim our power. The church, the, the, the keys to the kingdom, can you find your keys? Where are your keys? Where are your keys, church? Where are your keys? Not only are you missing the keys, you missing the keys somebody else gave. You lost somebody else's keys. And we need those keys so we can lose good things, so we can lose peace, we can lose justice, we can lose uh, feeding people, we can lose taking care of the people who are in jail, we can lose uh, giving water to the thirsty, we can lose... <laughs>